So welcome everybody. I'm Dana Mastriani, the Assistant Library Director in Rockport, Mass. Thank you for participating in another uh, episode of our European art series, Sacred Symbols and Devilish Details, Northern Renaissance Painting with the lovely Jane O'Neill today. Um, a few minor um, things to just remember, please keep yourself muted. Um, at the end, we will allow some questions uh, for Jane. If you think you may forget the question before the uh, program ends, put it in the chat and we will happily serve that up to her. We'll ask everybody to um, turn off their video and their uh, mute themselves. Um, I'd like to say a special shout out to all of the libraries who are collaborating on this. And from us personally, um, a special thanks to the Friends of the Rockport Library for helping to sponsor this. Um, so thank you once again. Um, today's uh, Sacred Symbols and Devilish Details, artists of the Northern Renaissance used single hair paintbrushes to capture astonishingly tiny details in their paintings. Explore these awe-inspiring additions and symbolic significance in high resolution and decode the meaning of religious and secular works from the period. A little bit about Jane. Jane was leading tours at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston when she first began to appreciate the special magic that happens when people look at art together and share their genuine reactions and questions. She holds a master's in art history from BU and a master's in education from Harvard University Graduate School of Education. So without any further delay, I will turn things over to you, Jane. And once again, I thank everybody for joining. Um, Marnie, who is lovely enough to co-host, um, will be putting a link to the next um, uh, European Art Series program, as well as names that are mentioned in the um, presentation today. So nobody has to fight like myself with uh, spelling and looking things up. So thank you, everybody. And thank you, Jane. Thank you so much, Dana. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in this afternoon, for taking time out of your day to learn a little bit more about this really fascinating period of art. So we will be getting into some pretty well-known works, delving into the symbolism, including the work on the screen here, the famous double portrait by Jan van Eyck, and maybe see a few works that you've never seen before as well. But it's always really fun to sort of learn a little bit more about the, the secret meaning behind everyday objects in paintings from this period. So we'll spend a lot of time figuring out what these paintings really mean because they are just chalk Full of symbols. So I want to give you a sense in terms of how we'll spend this next hour together. Here's our program overview. We're going to start off with a general introduction to the early Northern Renaissance. And when I say early Northern, I basically mean the 1400s. And when I say Northern, I basically mean North of the Alps in Europe. So it's a very specific time, very specific place. We are before the Renaissance when we think of like Michelangelo or Raphael, and we're in a different part of Europe where the focus is on the minute, is often on the minute. <laughs> so then after we get situated and we really understand what these artists are interested in, we'll look at some sacred symbols, and then our devilish details, and then wrap up. So it's a pretty straightforward program, but um, I have this great image over here from the artist Hieronymus Bosch, who we'll be looking at in just, uh, well, a little bit later in today's program. And I think it's such a great analogy for the way that we'll engage with this material today. I'm going to zoom in on this image. It's called The Conjurer. And whenever I look at this image, I always think that this is sort of a scammer over here on the right who's playing uh, like a ball and cup game. But there's just this one figure who has been completely drawn into it, who's leaning over like a fool sort of, but is um, really trying to track what this figure on the right is doing with his hands. And to a certain degree, we're all going to be like that today because we're going to be leaning in and just in awe 
of these details. And then while we're doing it, hopefully nobody is pickpocketing us as this figure is over here on the far left. But this, this um, sort of stupefied wonder, <laughs> I think, is what a lot of these paintings can, um, can create in us, the audience. So without any further ado, let's get a little bit more familiar with the early Northern Renaissance, the 1400s. Now, I think it's important to know, starting off, that the early Northern Renaissance is coming out of the Gothic era. So when we think of the Gothic era, we think of stained glass windows like the one that we see over here on the right and tiny illuminated manuscripts, books that have these beautiful drawings in them. And so the two images that I have on the screen right now are really more about the Gothic era than the early Northern Renaissance, but it gives you a sense of like the seeds that kind of start this movement. So first of all, we see an interest in this kind of rich, saturated color, these bright, deep reds, these brilliant blues. And we also see a real interest and fascination with this all over dense patterning like you see in the foliage in this tiny little prayer book that's over here on the left. So these are kind of a, a visual tradition that will um, remain going out of the Gothic era and into this early Renaissance period. Now, on top of this kind of tradition that's happening, we also have a fairly new idea. And this is a painting of St. Augustine by the artist Carlo Crivelli, who I just love. He's such a great artist. But St. Augustine wasn't alive during the early Northern Renaissance. He was alive like two, um, well, I, I, I should say he was alive hundreds of years earlier, but he had a a really influential idea. And it, it's an idea that took root in the early Northern Renaissance and certainly influenced the artists. And the idea here is very simple. It's the idea that God is in everything. So if God is the creator, then he is ultimately responsible for every object, every material thing in our world. And so God is imbued in it in some way. And this is what inspired these artists of this day to disguise symbolism in everyday objects. All of a sudden, Anything in front of you could have religious significance when you think about God creating it and how might it be related to the stories from the Bible. So the focus for these artists, as you'll see, becomes the careful observation and recording of the observable world. Thank you, St. Augustine. <laughs> so let me give you a sense in terms of how that translates. We are looking at a masterwork by the artist Jan van Eyck. It's in the collection of the Louvre Museum, but it's actually kind of tiny. It's only about two feet by two feet. If you live in the Boston area, then you might remember seeing something fairly similar to this. There's a very similar uh, painting on a much larger scale, uh, but almost the exact same composition. So the, the painting here is called Madonna and the Chancellor Roland. And this is this is Roland over here. He was a, a, an actual person. He was in his 60s and he wanted to create this kind of votive painting or um, devotional painting where he could uh, be pictured alongside the divine in this moment of prayer. And so what Jan van Eyck has given us with this painting is is just stunning, beautiful, remarkable detail, but then also this ability to um, see out at, at a great distance. So we're going to see the microscopic and the telescopic. Let's dive in to how that really translates visually. So remember, this is a fairly small painting, two feet by two feet. We're gonna just zoom into the Madonna's head over here. And you can see that she's being crowned by an angel with this gorgeous crown. She, she was of course the queen of heaven. So it makes sense that an angel would be crowning her. If we zoom in, we can see that in this tiny painting, the angel Angel has this beautiful sort of silky hair. The crown itself is embedded with, um, with jewels and pearls and that sort of thing. And you can see all of the lovely details of the virgin's hair, her, of the way her ear is painted, her lovely complexion. So all, all of this minute detail is captured here. If we zoom back out again, I want to show you just one other passage that has, I think, some really remarkable detail here. Just above the Chancellor Roland's head, we have all 
all of these carved um, column capitals, those little tops on the capitals. And, um, and in this case, though, many of those carved capitals, if we zoom in, are telling stories or have really elaborate patterning in them. So what we're looking at is in actuality, in actuality, just a, you know, a, a few inches tall, really, but you can see uh, the, the complex designs that Van Eyck is using here, and even the tiny little figures that he's using to tell us these biblical stories. So this is all wondrous and awe-inspiring awe in its own right. But if we zoom back out once again, then Ike is giving us so much more than this, because of course, uh, Chancellor Roland and the Madonna and, and the Christ child are sitting in this kind of open air loggia, and we can look out past them. There's some figures sort of in the middle ground who are looking out, out into the distance. And so if we telescope out beyond them, we can see this whole incredible contemporary city on both sides of this river, uh, this lovely little bridge that's spanning uh, th that waterway. And we can see the detail of, of dozens of buildings, a major church, more over here on the right. And then even further out, there's there's construction on this little island in the middle of the river. We get the detail of, of uh, you know, a, an enormous mountain range in the distance, but even cultivated land in this middle ground. I mean, he is giving us a world of wonders in this picture. And so there's just simply so much to feast your eye on. So the microscopic and the telescopic, two big ideas. We're continuing on with this broad overview of the 1400s. So I wanted to share with you the concept of an altarpiece, a painted altarpiece. And it essentially means a uh, um, a hinged painting it usually has a large central panel with these two wings that open and close like the shutters of a, of a window. So with this image, we are looking at a closed altarpiece all the way shut. And when it's closed, oftentimes artists would paint these pictures on the exterior, usually with dull muted colors or grayscale like we see here. So they're called grisaille. And in this case, they're using this grisaille tonal palette to create the illusion of sculptural niches. And in this case, the sculptures are supposed to look like uh, Mary and the angel Gabriel, who is coming to announce that she is divinely pregnant. Now, when you open an altarpiece, there's a couple of really important ideas here. When you open it, you kind of by necessity have to keep those hinged panels sort of um, at a diagonal. You wouldn't open it flat or else the whole painting might sort of be a little unsteady. So if you think about it, this is almost like um, the two-dimensional version of like theater in the round. It sort of surrounds you. Typically these were created for church settings or for, or for private devotional and, and, and an object this size probably would have been in your house. It might've even been something that you pick up and move from room to room. But if you really wanted to meditate on the story and the life of Christ, what better way than to open up a painting like this and be fully absorbed and surrounded by these images. So the way you look at and understand a, a, a hinged panel painting like this, an altarpiece, is that the central panel, the largest is always the most important. But typically speaking, you read them from left to right. So in this case, this is the circumcision of Christ. We see this lovely detail of, of like the Gothic church setting where this is happening. Obviously, all of this is really anachronistic because these artists, as we're figuring out from the early 1400s, love to paint the world that they live in as opposed to the world that Christ lived in. So you get a lot of details of contemporary cityscapes, contemporary to the artists. Over here, we have a couple of different uh, scenes from the crucifixion of Christ. We can see him carrying the cross over here, and then we can see him crucified at the top center. And then finally, um, the entombment of Christ, uh, or the imminent entombment of Christ over on the far right. So we've got this whole narrative from, from left to right, but really the main show is front and center. Every now and then there's a fascinating deviation from this formula. And there's actually one that's at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, where the artist here, who's, whose name we don't even know, 
use this format of an altar piece to accentuate the torture actually of this particular saint. Let's make sure I get the saint's name uh, or the pronunciation of his name right, Hippolytus. <laughs> so he was drawn and quartered. That was the way he was martyred. So his arms and legs have been tied to uh, four different horses. And in order to emphasize, this is such a, a smart artistic decision on the part of, of the creator of this altarpiece, in order to emphasize that pulling in every direction, that extension, uh, he has used all three panels of this altarpiece to, to um, pull this, this figure's body in different directions. I think it's, it's a really striking image and I think it really stays with you once you see it. Now, the most famous painting, the most famous altarpiece from this time is the Ghent altarpiece. And if you've seen one of my programs before, you might say, okay, I've seen the Ghent altarpiece before, but just a quick reminder, this was painted right around the beginning of the 1400s. It's another work by um, Jan van Eyck and, and his brother Hubert. And it's really considered to be one of the most important paintings from the or since the classical past. It's on an enormous scale, almost 12 feet tall. This is the view of it over here on the left while the painting is closed. And again, we see those grisaille um, uh, details here that look like uh, three-dimensional sculptures uh, uh, presented to us, the viewer. And once again, we have another Annunciation scene while this altarpiece is closed. Because it's so big, we can see over here on the right, two figures involved in opening it up. And when you open the Ghent altarpiece, you are, I think, simply overwhelmed by the brilliant color that these artists use to tell these biblical stories here. Now, um, I always like to mention too, I, I mean, imagine living in the 1400s, imagine not having the kind of visual stimulation that we have around the clock today. It's in our hands, in our pockets, it's on our TVs once dinner's done. I, I mean, we are, we can see the most incredible things, uh, you know, the push of a button. And um, and when you're living in the 1400s, you, I, I can imagine people were just thirsty for this kind of vi visual stimulation. So in this case, I mean, who wouldn't just flock to see a picture like this? Now it's overwhelming in its scale. And obviously you can't get too close to any element of it. But what I'd like to do for you today, just to once again, sort of get us oriented with the, with the painting of the early 1400s is to zero in on this top central figure over here. It's a young bearded man, easy to mistake him for being Jesus. But in this case, this is actually a depiction of God the Father. Most artists avoided painting God because there is a passage in Exodus that says, thou canst see my face for that, for there shall uh, no man see me and live. So this idea that, that people can't see God is sort of extended into the visual arts. Um, and so for the most part, artists didn't depict him. But if we zoom in here, we can look at the face of God and, um, or at least Van Eyck's interpretation of it. And we see this, um, you know, sort of dazzling costume on uh, on God, on his body, on his head here. Uh, this is the triple crown of heaven. What a, an elaborate sort of robe that he's wearing. It's jewel encrusted, it's gold line. Um, the, this clasp that, that, that gathers at his chest here is uh, practically the size of his face with just these enormous pearls and, and gemstones in it. But if we move in just a little bit closer, get a little bit more into it, with the face of God. And of course, the average person isn't even tall enough to get this close to this uh, face in this painting. I just want to draw your attention to the fact that you can see individual hairs on the head of this depiction of God. My eye always goes to what I think is just one little white hair over here in his beard. Uh, think about like the intimacy and the care that these artists took in terms of rendering something that looks like this. And it, of course, it extends beyond the way that, that the hair and the face is painted. I mean, you can see it in, in every single glistening pearl and gem here. And to spend that much detail, time and concern and effort with every single square inch of something that is so massive, 
always boggles my mind. So one last big lesson about the early Northern Renaissance, and I think we can see it pretty clearly in a comparison like this. So over on the left, we have a work from the early Northern Renaissance. This is a work that's in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's just over three feet tall. The artist is Petrus Christus, and it's called A Goldsmith's Shop. It dates to right around mid-century. So we have all of this wonderful detail of what a goldsmith's shop might look like. And of course, the oil paint that is used to describe all of these wonderful things in the material world that St. Augustine tell us all represent God in some way, they're all kind of glistening in the same way as the Ghent altarpiece glistens. Even the details of this woman's robes over here, it's all just gorgeous. The artists know how to pull us in. Look at how the sash is extending over the edge of the goldsmith's table. It almost makes us feel like we could pull on it ourselves. We also see a figure in this convex mirror here. It almost feels like it's a reflection of ourselves approaching this goldsmith's table. It also sort of reminds me of like check out at Target when you see your own uh, your uh, your own semblance on on the security cameras there. Um, but I want to contrast all of this gleaming, glistening material stuff over here on the left with what's happening on the right, because what we see on the right is not the early Northern Renaissance. It's the same time period, but it's a painting that's done down in the South. This is an Italian painting um, by the artist uh, Piero della Francesca, and it's a depiction of Christ's resurrection. It's painted about 10 years after the goldsmith shop over here, so about 14 60. And so for the Italians, you can see that they're not interested in the glittering material world. The Italians have almost always been interested in anatomy and perspective and composition. So we have this very orderly composition with Christ right there at the center, this sort of neat pyramid organizing the entire uh, work of art. The other important idea here too is that the Italians, for the most part, were really interested in creating fresco paintings where they would paint directly into wet plaster so that when it was finished and dried, it, the painting would become a permanent part of the wall. The effect then was to have these kind of muted colors here. Everything looks like it's got like a little bit of a pastel wash on it. Whereas with the oil paint and in the early Northern Renaissance, you can see the brilliant greens and the reds and the golds. It's really just the right material for the kinds of interests that these artists have. So, now we've got our little primer on the period and we're going to spend some time with some of the best known works from this period. We're gonna start off with our sacred symbols and look at this masterwork that's at the Cloisters Museum owned by the Metropolitan Museum. Um, this is, once again, an altarpiece. You can see that those wings are, are just open a little bit. And a work like this would have been created for private devo devotion. It wouldn't have been for a church setting. This would have been something for your home. It's about two feet tall, just to give you a sense of, of scale here. And it's painted by an artist named Robert Campen or his workshop. There's been a lot of research on this and a lot of scholarly debate over the years. But it's generally known as the Marode altarpiece, and it's often ca called um, the Annunciation Triptych. We've already seen a couple scenes of the angel Gabriel and Mary. We're going to dive into this scene here. Generally speaking, this altarpiece is understood as kind of a reflection of the time and place that it was created. It was... Um, it's a reflection of, of sort of newfound prosperity in early Northern Europe. So we're going to see this kind of emphasis on, on uh, a high standard of living and even luxury goods. So as we know, let's zoom in here, get a little bit closer to this altarpiece. We can see it's a really richly detailed scene. We can see that there are multiple figures. And once again, it's a story that seems to unfold from left to right, but it's that central panel that, um, that is most important. And in this case, the central panel was probably done on spec. Uh, the artist probably knew I can sell a lot of these kinds of panels. 
and then they can personalize what the what the what the wings of this altarpiece might look like. So let's spend a little bit uh, time a little bit of time looking at this central panel here and getting more familiar with the Annunciation scene. Oh, this is a great resolution image. It's so satisfying to look at. All right. So in this highly detailed setting, once again, everything has symbolic meaning. We are, first of all, in a setting that is a reflection of the times in which this painting was created, not the time in which Mary, the mother of Jesus, lived. This is like a 15th century townhouse, essentially. And, um, and what we are going to see are all of these different symbols that are embedded into the real world. They wouldn't necessarily stand out to our eye today, which is which, what makes it kind of fun to learn a little bit more about them. Now, first and foremost, we see Mary and she is sitting on the floor alongside this very long bench. Now, why is she sitting on the floor? That is a great way to suggest Mary's humility here. And you might be wondering about what she is holding. I think Dana and Marnie who are on our Zoom today will really appreciate the fact that she is holding a little prayer book. But in those days, your books would have been your most valued, precious possessions, literally the most expensive things you own. So people used to hold cloths over them so that they wouldn't make them dirty. I really love that detail. Um, and so in this moment, the angel Gabriel has, has appeared here. And we also see um, a, a couple of other wonderful details that tell us that as the angel Gabriel is telling Mary that she is divinely pregnant, that this room sort of signifies both her purity and how that purity has, has literally been extinguished. So I want to zoom in here because we also have the Holy Spirit in this room. He is represented presented not as a dove, but as a tiny little Christ child with a cross who is flying into this room from this round window on a beam of light. It's as though he's just going to transport himself right into his mother's womb. <laughs> crucifix and all. So um, so we have have this representation of of um, of the actual uh, uh, sort of implantation of, of the Christ child here. Now I also want to point out that there's a couple of other details that speak to Mary and and sort of how protected her body has been as she is a virgin up until this point. So the fact that the artist has included this wash basin with the towel in the in the back background, that's usually an understanding of a reference to Mary's purity. Even the fire screen in this case sort of uh, represents some, something that's been guarded, something that's been protected. If we turn our eye now to this tabletop too, we can see that there are these uh, white uh, flowers here, which are, uh, again, another reference to Mary and, and her purity. And we also have this incredible detail of the candle that has just been extinguished. Next time you extinguish a, a candle, just enjoy for a moment how the smoke sort of uh, overlaps itself, goes back and forth, and that the artist has captured it in this particular painting. It's just a lovely little detail there. So, um, so all, and of course, what does that signify that the candle has been extinguished? Well, of course, that Mary's, Mary's virginity is gone in this moment too. So everything here has this important meaning. I want to zoom out just for a moment and remind us that that these artists from the early northern renaissance are not at all concerned about perspective. So when you see an image like this and you have this bench that's receding back into like this really dry, uh, dramatic diagonal, and then you have this 16-sided tabletop where we're seeing it from the side and the top simultaneously, you might be thinking, wow, does this artist just not get it? If you compare it to a fresco created right around the same time down in Italy, they understand linear perspective perfectly. You've got all of these lines converging right here on the body of Jesus. Jesus, that's not the that's not the emphasis of Northern Renaissance artists. Instead, they want to make sure you can see that tabletop so you can understand and appreciate each one of these objects and their symbolic meaning. 
Now we're going to zoom out once again and turn our attention to that left, to that panel on the left side over here, because this is really where the story begins. So you can see that there's a door opening up over here and there's a man and a woman who are just outside that door and they're on their knees. This is another consistent theme for, for with paintings from this time period. The idea that there are these interior settings or even doors in this case, uh, where we see figures who are sitting or kneeling, but if they were to stand up, they would be way too tall for that space. If this figure, if this man were to stand up, he obviously wouldn't even be able to fit through this door. So there's um, another strange shift of scale and perspective when it comes to the figures and their relationship to, to the architecture. The architecture is another good way to kind of separate out the divine from the average Joe Schmo, like we see over here. So, um, so you would never, you would never really put yourself just sitting across from Mary in the way that Chancellor Roland did before. So most uh, most patrons of the arts would always have themselves depicted in a separate panel, like we see over here. So let's zoom in on those figures, and you can see there's there's really stunning and beautiful realism in their faces, but they are not painted as divinely perfect as that angel in, in the face of Mary that we saw before. Notice that this gentleman here, you can see the wrinkles in his forehead and he looks like a real person. This looks like the face of somebody that you might see when you're at the grocery store, as opposed to somebody that's been totally idealized. Now, um, now there's a lot that's happening here. The, this couple is coming in through this kind of um, uh, uh, walled garden. And once again, the walled garden, uh, you can probably see it a little bit better over here in the, in the whole panel on the right. The walled garden is supposed to be another um, symbol of, of Mary's purity. We also see uh, an open gate here. And sometimes art historians argue that the gate is a representation of the gates of heaven. So you come into this walled garden, you pray to Mary and you can get into heaven. Now, every single element of this picture has symbolic meaning really. So the roses just behind them are red. That's oftentimes thought to be a, a symbol of Jesus's sacrifice. Actually medieval sources said that red rose, or that uh, roses were red because Christ's blood ran on them. There is just an astonishing level of detail here. I, I love that there's this kind of guard figure over by the gate. The, the decoration in terms of his costume but that you can see, you know, a whole city street out here, people walking by on horses, a little shop that's open in the distance. It's really kind of mind boggling. So we've got our microscopic and our telescopic here. Now, if we move our focus down to essentially where the steps are, where the knees of these donors or these patrons are, we can see uh, the steps up into the space where Mary and the angel are. But we also see this little patch of earth. And in this patch of earth, there's all kinds of plants that have important and uh, uh, symbolic significance here. There are, um, well, everything here is associated with, with, with Mary. You see little strawberries here. That's an association with the fruitful virgin. We also see forget-me-nots, which are also called the eyes of Mary, and violets, which are symbols of humility. So, I mean, literally every blade of grass here has, has an important meaning in telling the story of what's happening in this altarpiece. So we're going to zoom out once again, and we'll finish up fairly quickly with this last panel over here on the right. Now this would be Joseph. And this is a really interesting choice on the part of the artist because um, if that's Joseph and he's working in his shop as a carpenter, that means Mary, who is not yet his wife, is actually just hanging around in his house, which would probably not be the case. But let's turn our attention to Joseph in a little bit more detail. Uh, you can see that he's opened up these panels, these windows, so that he can put his shopwares out on um, out on these ledges, sort of like the goldsmith that we saw before, so that people could walk right up to him from the city street and buy his wares. I love that little detail here. We can see him working on a bench. We've got all of the detail of um, not just the city in the distance, contemporary to the artist and, and, and not the figures from the Bible, um, but we can also see all the details of, of Joseph's tools and materials. And so a lot has ink, a lot of ink has been spilled 
over what he is actually doing. So as a carpenter, he is using obviously wood and various tools, and he's actually fashioning these little mouse traps. And so art historians generally agree that the mouse traps are a, are a, a reference once again to St. Augustine, who I believe was the person who said that Christ sort of functioned as like a as as a mouse trap on uh, on the cross, as as a trap for the devil. So this would be an, another symbol, once again, sort of referencing an important story related to to Jesus here. I also want to draw your attention to the fact that that um, Joseph is a much older man as he was, um, and that he's wearing this sort of unusual uh, uh, headpiece here. We're going to see something like this come up again. Well, imminently. So, and actually, we're going to turn our attention now to another major work from the early Northern Renaissance. Just keep that blue hat in mind. But this next work we're going to see, we're going to turn our attention back to the artist Van, Van Eyck. He is really... He's the hero of this time period. We can't get enough of him. We're going to look at um, this very small self-portrait. And I think that, I hope that this photograph gives you a sense uh, in terms of the scale here. It's really only about nine inches tall. It's a really tiny painting. So as we zoom in on it, you shall see that it is remarkable in its detail here. So the hat looks familiar right off the bat here, right? <laughs> um, these were, were not called turbans, they were called chaperones and they were, um, they were all the rage in terms of the style of the day. And clearly you just wanted to have this kind of artfully arranged um, um, pile of, of, of fabric on your head here. I, I, I don't know if there was any one simple way to arrange it. So, um, so this is generally regarded as a self-portrait by the artist Jan van Eyck. And I love this program, putting this program together in, in PowerPoint, because as I'm laying out these images on the grid, I can see that these artists all used grids while they were laying out their paintings. So there's something really satisfying about lining this up on the grid and seeing that the corner of his eye is right there on that vertical axis and that his mouth basically basically lines up with, with the horizontal axis here. So the way that this is thought out and planned, I, I just delight in that. So he is looking outwards at us with this kind of piercing gaze. It's very direct, isn't it? And this is possibly the first time any artist has painted a portrait that looks like this in about a millennium, which is pretty impressive to think about. All right, you might be thinking, well, this is the exact same pose as the Mona Lisa, but the Mona Lisa is practically a century later. So Van Eyck is doing something really innovative for the time. And he, not only is he painting this portrait, but he is doing it with like, um, sparing no detail, essentially. We can see the crow's feet around the edges of the eye. We can even see that this eye is a little bit bloodshot, too. As we move down the face to that um, to that sort of pinched mouth that we see, we can also see that he has got a five o'clock shadow here. And then, just a quick reminder, the exact same hat, or very similar hat, as the Joseph that we just saw in the Marode altarpiece. So he didn't paint that other painting, but, but clearly the style had sort of made its way around. So why do people think that this could be a self-portrait? Well, actually, it's the frame that gives us the best clue. This is the original frame of the work of art, and you can see that there's text at the top and at the bottom. It looks like it's carved in there into the wooden frame, but it's actually painted to look like it could be carved. And the frame itself has this very illuminating um, text. So it says, Van Eyck made me, uh, and across the top, or uh, okay, no, at the bottom it says Van Eyck made me and the precise date and at the top it says as I can and that's considered to be a little bit of a play on the artist's last name Van Eyck as I can <laughs> so um so just that that word play and the fact that it's a small work and you can imagine that the, that the artist would have wanted to keep something like this and show it to potential clients and say this is how I can, this is how well I can paint. He can hold it against um, the, the real thing, against his own face and show um, just how talented he is at capturing uh, all of this detail. 
So we know that he scored a number of significant commissions, including this painting that is hanging right alongside it. This is at the National Gallery in London. And so let's turn our attention now to probably the most famous double portrait ever. <laughs> this is known as the Arnolfini double portrait or the Arnolfini wedding portrait. You know you've arrived if during COVID lockdowns people are... Um, you know, dressing up as as you, as 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 the as one of the most famous paintings of all time, and I think that this couple really nailed it. Between the the big bulky <laughs> green dress, the dog in the foreground, you're going to see that they they that they thought of every detail here. So um, so we have a sense that this painting isn't too big to know. We quickly compare it to Van Eyck's uh, self-portrait. It's really only about three, it's less than three feet tall by about two feet wide. So it's another fairly small painting, but it accomplishes so much because the artist is using this glorious oil paint and, um, and can capture so much detail. Now, the reason the title for this painting keeps shifting is because researchers, um, are understanding more and more and discovering more and more about what the potential for this relationship really is. It's generally thought to be this uh, Italian merchant, um, uh, Gianni Arnolfini, and his wife, but he was married twice and the dates don't neatly line up. <clears throat> with when he got married and when these women died. So we're not really sure which, which wife it is. Maybe this is a posthumous portrait. Um, the other big misconception about this painting, of course, is related to the woman and whether or not she is pregnant. Whenever I showed this to college students, they were always like, she's pregnant. <laughs> Clearly, these were the kinds of concerns that were on the mind of college age kids, but that was just the style for the time. And I always like to tell people, I can't wait until having a very big belly comes back into fashion. I'll fit right in. So um, what I want to do, first of all, as we look at this painting is actually move past this couple and show you one of the most remarkable details in all of art history. We're going to be looking at this back wall here and the elements of this uh, that we're going to be focusing on, notice that they are so wonderfully framed by this figure or these two figures and this kind of awkward hand holding that they're doing here. As we zoom to that back wall, what you'll see is that Van Eyck signed his name essentially right at the center of the picture. He was clearly very proud of this, right? Most artists definitely don't do that. Right underneath his signature, there is a convex mirror uh, that has these little roundels that uh, uh, spell out the, the passion of Christ. You can see the crucifixion pretty clearly right here at the top. Just to give you a sense in terms of how tiny those roundels are, they're about the size of your fingernail. <laughs> and so, the, uh, so our artist here, Ben, I was so accomplished in creating the illusion that, uh, that well, creating the illusion of each one of these scenes, but also the illusion that it's been carved in wood and sort of lacquered um, with some sort of oil finish so, so that there's this wonderful shine to it. I know that they're really accomplished uh, nail artists today, but I don't think there was anything uh, or anybody else who could have uh, who could have done what Van Eyck is, has done here. Now with this mirror, we can see back into the room where our two protagonists were standing. Here's the back of Arnolfini, here's the back of his bride. And if we zoom in even a little bit more, we can see that there's more people in the room. There's somebody wearing blue, there's somebody wearing red, and they are essentially standing where we, the viewer, would be. So this sort of involves us in this kind of fascinating way, but you'll notice that um, that one of those figures is wearing uh, red fabric on his head. And it would make sense that Van Eyck as the artist would paint himself in this picture. I mean, he's already painted his signature front and center, but if he was there painting it, he would have seen himself in the reflection. And so there he is as just a, a few tiny dabs of paint that show us just how, um, how amazing it is to have this kind of telescopic view like we saw before um, with Chancellor Roland. And we actually saw a, a, you know, a, a similar figure to Van Eyck and his red chaperone because even in Chancellor Roland, if we zoom out, there is another figure sort of in that middle ground wearing a, a very similar uh, sort of pile of fabric on his head in this kind of artful arrangement. So if we go back to Van Eyck and this famous 
double portrait that we were looking at, I just wanted to share with you some of the other kind of tantalizing details in this picture. First of all, don't you just love the details of this green dress that she's wearing? The way that he has really captured, um, you know, the the down to the minute styles, the fabric and um, and the cut of this dress, I think are really amazing. He's also really interested in, um, in the fabrics and the weaving on the floor. But in this case, both of these figures have taken off their shoes and sort of kicked them to the side, which for a lot of art historians for many years sort of suggested that this was a marriage ceremony and that the, there was something happening in this moment that would suggest that they're standing on sacred ground, even though they're standing in their apartment here. That might clarify why they took off their shoes like this. Now, the next detail I want to draw your attention to, which is so beautiful, is just over here, right behind Arnolfini himself. We've got um, an open window and, and a wooden chest just below it. And on that open window are, um, and, and on that chest are a couple of pieces of fruit. I believe they're just oranges, but, um, but they tell us so much about the time of year, about the wealth of of these individuals. And in this case, they have symbolic meaning. Whenever you're looking at fruit, it's um, it's a good opportunity for an artist to suggest uh, 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 fertility, to make us think about seeds and, and, um, and you know, new life springing forth. <laughs> now, just beyond our, our female protagonist over here, there is a, a carved wooden headboard. And the top of that wooden headboard has this carved figure, uh, a female figure with a dragon just underneath her. That is Saint Margaret, who is the patron saint of childbirth. So a nice sort of symbol that, uh, that aligns with the fruit over there on the windowsill uh, that if this is a marriage, then hopefully it will be a very fruitful marriage. Now, one last wonderful detail with this work that I think so many people really love is that dog front and center. It's a really cute little pup, although it almost suggests that, that Van Eyck never saw this dog in, in real life. It's sort of a made up uh, a species there. Um, but of course, when it comes to dogs in art, dogs always function as symbols of love and fidelity. Artists want to conjure in your head how your dog is just so happy when you come home. Nothing loves you like your dog. And that's why we, you know, we have this traditional dog name of Fido. It comes from the Latin uh, word for fidelity. So love, fidelity, um, fruitfulness, these are all things that are embedded into this particular image. And it's so fun to think about what else might have some important significance here. So we're gonna wrap up our sacred symbols and really that's the emphasis of the program. Um, before we head into devilish details, we're gonna wrap up by looking at the famous unicorn tapestries and they are at the Cloisters Museum. Um, in New York City as well. Now, I just wanted to give you sort of a, a quick overview just in case you've never been there. Um, the unicorn tapestries are considered to be some of the most beautiful, most complex works from the Middle Ages that survive. They were uh, woven out of this uh, fine wool and silk. There is some um, silver and, and gold thread in there as well. There are seven tapestries altogether. We're not even sure if they are a coherent series, if they all belong together, but um, most of them are roughly the same size, about 12 feet by eight feet. Now, they were made about 500 years ago. And just to give you a sense in terms of how complicated it was to weave something like this, it would take a day of ex it would take experts a full day to weave essentially a square inch of something like this. And so if you lived in a medieval castle, your tapestries would actually be more valuable than the castle itself. So these are considered like the best status symbol of all times. And this particular cycle of tapestries is considered one of the best in the world. So let's get familiar with it really quickly. I'm just gonna move through these images fairly quickly. Um, this is generally thought to be the beginning of the series. We see the hunter entering the woods. They are there, of course, to hunt the unicorn. And I want to just briefly remind you and compare back to that Gothic uh, manuscript that we'd seen before with that dense patterning. This is what we see sort of holding on and carrying over into the uh, early Northern Renaissance, because there is nothing but like lush, detailed patterning of the natural world in these tapestries. And we've also got the great costumes of these hunters here as well. You'll notice these um, 
these letters encoded into these tapestries again and again. And try as they might, scholars have not been able to definitively connect the um, those initials to any single person. So there's a lot of theories out there, but unfortunately, those those initials are not the 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 Rosetta Stone for understanding all of this. Now, if you flip these tapestries around, you can see that the side that has not been exposed to light has even more brilliant colors here. So you can imagine when these things were first woven before um, they were sort of faded by the sun, that they would have had the richest color um, that would have really sort of transfixed anybody. So if we move through the story fairly quickly, our hunters here are in the woods and they have spotted the unicorn who is front and center here in this kind of menage of um, animals and birds. And in this moment, the unicorn is sticking its magical horn into the stream to purify the water. So all of the hunters have, have um, identified him. They're sort of talking about how to approach this unicorn here. And once again, you can see these initials making their uh, appearance throughout the picture. Then the hunters go in for the attack. And so we have this incredible composition of all these lances sort of coming at the unicorn in this moment. The dogs are there. Um, this is uh, this is like an overwhelming attack in this moment. We even have uh, this figure over here blowing the horn. We can imagine how panic stricken this particular unicorn is. So of course he fights back and he starts sort of kicking with his rear legs here at, at, um, at the hunters, but there are already wounds on his body uh, and um, and dogs attacking him. Notice with uh, with his horn here, he is actually goring a dog in the foreground. And I mean, there's so many details that we're just passing over here, but I just wanted to give you a sense in terms of what happens. Then there's this random, <laughs> fairly random uh, scrap, these two sort of mysterious uh, and sort of like deliciously mysterious uh, fragments of a tapestry that tell us that what might happen next to that, um, that this unicorn that has been attacked has found solace with the beautiful maiden. We don't even see the maiden. This would be like her, um, her servant, essentially. We just see her arm right here and she's petting the unicorn and she's calmed him down and he doesn't even notice that there are dogs licking his wounds. But the maid, the, the servant woman, um, is signifying to one of the hunters, yes, we have the unicorn here. So then the hunters, well, they kill the unicorn. It's really, it's like heartbreaking to watch. So we see um, the unicorn being stabbed once again, and then we see the unicorn dead at the center of this tapestry here being brought on the back of a horse to um, this ar aristocratic couple in the foreground. Notice um, the, the castle-like architecture just behind them. Uh, Generally speaking, this is thought to be an allegory of the crucifixion of Christ. It's not hard and fast, but one of the details that I find most compelling here is that the unicorn's horn has been removed and it's been tied to his body um, with essentially like a crown of thorns here. So it does sort of seem like the persecution and the execution of Christ in a lot of ways. But this last tapestry, which is without a doubt the most famous, doesn't quite fit into that narrative. And it might be completely separate, but it's generally thought to be the end of this um, cycle of tapestries. And that of course is, is simply um, the unicorn uh, it, uh, in captivity here. And so what has happened? Uh, the unicorn is alive again. Is it representative of Christ? Is this is a symbol of the resurrection or is he in paradise? It's hard to know. Most art historians tend to agree that this is something separate and this is more about um, sort of the the um, the pursuit of somebody that is beloved and then the beloved being sort of captured. So, I mean, a great theme for Valentine's Day, right? You fixate on somebody and then they're yours. And once they become yours, it's not, it's not necessarily a ball and chain situation, but you will notice that this little um, unicorn is tethered to this tree with this tiny little gold chain. And of course he is um, held captive by this tiny little fence. He could break that chain. He could jump over the fence very easily, but he is happy to be captive, essentially, is, is how this is generally thought of. Now, you might have really good eyes and say, well, isn't this unicorn still bleeding? In fact, um, the, the red little splotches there are thought to be um, 
uh, not blood, but juice from the pomegranates in the tree up above. And one last kind of fascinating detail about the unicorn in captivity is that another reason this is thought to be something more related to, to, to love is because there's this tiny little frog right here. I mean, how long would you have had to look at this before you found the frog? Um, and thus, this frog in particular was noted by medieval people for being uh, incredibly noisy when it made <laughs> so this was a frog that had these associations with love. Why not put it with your unicorn? <laughs> All right. So now in our last few moments, we're just going to touch on a few paintings with some really devilish details just to balance out all of those sweet symbols of, of fertility that we've seen so far. All right. So I wanted to give you a sense in terms of what the early Northern Renaissance artists thought <laughs> the devil looked like. So we are looking at a small picture by the Limburg brothers and it's generally just known as hell this is um this is painted in 1416 and because this is a, a, an illuminated manuscript it's really not much bigger than the size of your hand so it's just full of detail here and full of devils too you probably see a lot of uh sort of scary looking horned figures here but the king of them all the one wearing the crown is the one that is on this funeral pyre we notice that all of the sinners all of the damned are almost always naked figures sort of writhing in a space together and in this case this devil is like eating them and like spitting them up into the air and these other devils are um are literally using uh these tools to blow more fuel on the fire so it's hot it's uncomfortable. It's no place you want to be. And in, it's sort of fascinating. In this case, uh, the artist has included a few figures in the foreground who are being sort of brought into hell. And they do look like they are members of the church. They look like they're just arriving there. So I'm sure that there's a little bit of um, political religious commentary that's happening here as well. Interestingly, our devil who has um, horns and these long ears, sort of a, um, a humanoid torso, but then these kind of bird-like legs, he's not blue. And generally speaking, from about the fourth or fifth century on, um, uh, the devil was blue. So it's an interesting choice on the part of this artist here. We're going to turn our attention to a work at the Metropolitan Museum of Art that is known as um, the Crucifixion and Last Judgment. This is a closed altar piece that we're looking at right now, painted by Jan van Eyck. We've got our crucifix over here. We've got Jesus in the position of, uh, of, of, of judge. We've got this kind of heavenly tribunal. Uh, uh, Michael, the archangel just below him, we can zoom in on this detail here. And um, and we've got hell just underneath. So if you've if you've been judged worthy to um to rise up into heaven, you can see these figures emerging from their graves down here at the bottom left. But if you have not lived a good and virtuous life, Jesus is going to send you down into this horrific hell here that is um really terrifying and, and dense with patterning and um and and every single inch of it is covered with some sort of new monstrous beast i always think that artists have a better time imagining what hell looks like that more than any other element of of their careers so we see things that um have more than one head that are eating that are excreting things and of course all these nude bodies writhing around in hell and i love that this giant skeleton is sort of the gateway to that so um, Van Eyck sort of imagines a more specific and horrifying torture because the bodies here are really not just being burned, but they're kind of being pierced and torn apart in the hell that he imagines here. So, um, it, I mean, you could spend a lot of time finding more and more tentacles and spikes and antlers. Um, everything, everybody is, is being pierced in, in unusual and really creative ways, but nothing compares to Hieronymus Bosch's altarpiece called the Garden of Earthly Delights. This is, of, co of course, the closed version of it where we see this um, globe that sort of looks like a snow globe here. It has this kind of glass uh, top to it. This is our grisaille painting. And of course, when we open it up, we are overwhelmed by the color and the scale of this particular work, which was never intended for a church setting. This was definitely intended for a private client because there is a lot of kinks to the Garden of Earthly Delight. It's about six feet tall and more than 12 feet wide. And generally speaking, it is thought to be a picture all about 
sin. So we've got over here the creation of man, um, Adam and Eve in the nude with God the Father in the foreground. I think I've got a detail over here. And of course, when you're creating man, if you're God, you are that is the moment where you're also creating sin. This isn't necessarily the apple tree over here, but oftentimes um, the tree of knowledge was represented as a, a fig tree too, if, if I'm not mistaken. So that might be what Hieronymus Bosch is reaching for here as he's thinking about sin. But it's really what happened after Adam and Eve leave paradise. He shows us, um, you know, the main stage here, just how wild humanity can be. But he ups the ante by um, creating all of these sort of wild combinations of humans and fruit and giant birds. <laughs> so you can see a lot of those giant birds over here. Um, you can see people uh, uh, coupling off and canoodling in all sorts of ways. But we also see a few couples that are encased in these little bubbles. And it's often thought that, the, that these uh, pictures are sort of like proverbs uh, that would function like um, sending the message that, that happiness is is as fragile as a bubble or happiness is as fragile as glass. But it's that that distant view in, in the central panel that shows us just how far Hieronymus Bosch has imagined this garden of earthly delights. I can see these tiny little animals in the pastures in the background. We have birds flying up in the distance as well as, you know, figures in armor on giant fish. There's all sorts of, of really bizarre combinations of things here, which leads us all to where all of these sinners are ultimately going to go. And that is hell. That is the right side panel here. And this is where Hieronymus Bosch really shines because his, um, his ability to bring together disparate kinds of objects um, is, is used to its most terrifying uh, uh, extent here. So with this detail, I mean, obviously, Obviously, we see this, this human figure that's sort of disintegrating in front of us. But I also want to draw your attention really just to like the giant ears here that have been pierced by a spear. And where you think a face or a nose might be, there's just this blade. So of course, there's all these associations with, um, with phallic type imagery here. But generally speaking, the devil in this depiction of hell is thought to be this, this bird-headed figure here who is blue and is also eating and excreting human beings. I mean, you really don't want to end up in hell because Bosch is letting us know just how bad it is. Um, my favorite section here is how he imagines that humans will be um, tortured it, for, you know, for all time by instruments, of, by musical instruments, really, in hell. So we've got somebody who's encased in a drum over here. Imagine feeling those vibrations. You thought it was bad when your kid used to play drums in the, in the garage. Imagine living in the drum. Or imagine the strings of a harp uh, being impaled on those strings, having those strings go through your body and what those vibrations might feel like if somebody were to pluck those strings. So Bosch has quite the imagination and is giving us a truly terrifying hellscape. One thought or one interpretation when you close this panel up again and you see this sort of orb of the earth, one thought is that um, this is when God sends in the flood to sort of wash away all of these sins. So we've seen a lot of devilish details, a lot of sacred symbols. Let's just quickly conclude with some big ideas here, our big takeaways. We've seen the interest in the microscopic detail, whether it's a strand of hair or a blade of grass, emerging from this belief that, go that God is in everything. We've also seen um, artists with this incredible ability to overwhelm us with the, the details of the material world with these telescopic vistas here. And then finally, we've seen this kind of dense and complex patterning, sometimes signifying the divine and often portraying a web of malevolence. So I hope this past hour has had you leaning in a little bit dumbfounded. That's exactly what these artists wanted. I'll stop talking for now. And I welcome any questions or comments you might have about the works that we looked at today. So as always, Jane, uh, so in-depth and just um, pure um, unadulterated information and so grateful for that. A couple of comments that I'll go through here. Uh, some are questions, some are comments. In the painting before the altar piece, so this is very early on. Yeah. In the first one, Jesus looks very unhealthy. 
bags under his eyes, for example. Any thoughts on why he would be portrayed looking less than healthy? Hmm. I'm going to see if I can find that picture before the altarpiece. Oh, this one, maybe. <laughs> yes. um, I think, I don't think it was that one. Go. Can you go back more or is that? Um, I think that was one of the first ones we saw. Yeah. Okay. So maybe it is that one. Um, why he would look unhealthy. Well, I will say that artists <laughs> throughout the centuries have really struggled to make, um, great looking babies <laughs> because I, I don't think babies have, have made great models. Um, if, if the question was about this particular depiction of Jesus, it's a great question. I don't know if there's, I don't know if I have a satisfying answer when it comes to the way this Christ child looks, but yeah, he doesn't look healthy at all, but it almost, it, I mean, the only thing that comes to mind is, um, Oftentimes with depictions of the Christ child, you'll see like a really mournful looking Mary, the Madonna of Sorrows, because she knows um, what his ultimate fate will be. And that's the only thing that that comes to mind right now is that the artist is in some way trying to signify what his ultimate fate will be, that he will be sacrificed on the cross. And so, um, so you know, you sort of get the sense of melancholy in, in a baby, but um, but I could be wrong there. And there might be people that, that sort of know um, um, know their religious texts a little bit better than I do. So if you wanted to jump in and share anything, please feel free to do so. The same person asks, are there other depictions of Jesus's circumcision? I don't remember ever seeing the subject before. Great question. I don't think that was the only ever depiction. Um, I don't think it always takes place in a Gothic church the way we saw it there. And um, there it is. Um, but I think, I, 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 I know I've seen it before, so I don't think that this is the only the only time that that happens, but um, great question. Now now it's like, I wanna delve in and I'm like, how many are there? <laughs> but, but I don't think that this is the only one. Back to the picture uh, of the couple with the green dress. Yeah. Um, the person notes that, that she doesn't think that the person, uh, the woman looks um, pregnant, but rather it's tucked the, uh, material is tucked into her belt, but she says, "Our initial, our initials, not an alpha and omega tied together with a ribbon." Ooh, our initials, not an alpha and omega tied together with a ribbon. Hmm. Huh. Maybe. Um, oh, maybe that's the reference to the initials in the unicorn tapestry. No, I think. Um, hmm. I'm not sure. This um, might be too separate, but um, yeah, when it comes to her dress, I'm not sure if I'm seeing anything with a ribbon. Re, um, about the unicorn tapestries, the person asks, are these related to the unicorn tapestries in Paris? I believe so. I'm not sure if... Um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure what the relationship is, but I would be really surprised to... Uh, uh, to learn that they were created by by separate um, sort of uh, hubs, uh, tapestry making hubs, because it's such a specific iconography. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I mean, obviously, visually, they're 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 um, they're very much related. So I I would guess, and I'm sure it's easy to find out um, that they were probably made around the same place around the same time too. That's a great question. I'm sorry I didn't include anything about the the, the Paris unicorn. Back to the Bosch um, tapestry, what's the symbolism of the dragonfly that was next to the frog in the unicorn? Oh, tapestry? right, right, right. Um, you know, that's a really good question. I should have been better prepared on that one. I'm not sure offhand if it does have any symbolism, but I mean, it's safe to say that everything has symbolism here. So I'm not sure if, it, if, if anybody else knows better. It looks like there's a few of them too, um, what they might signify here. Um, I, I'd be all ears, but imagine trying to find that frog in there. They're somewhere over here. <laughs> and it's amazing to think, you know, how many other little creatures are embedded in all of, you know, the um, the flowers and, and, and the greenery here. The person uh, with the Alpha and Omega, the initials question is in reference to the unicorn tapestry, if that's helpful. I think these are generally understood to be an A and an, and a backwards E. Uh, okay. And I think they've gone through, it's really interesting to think about alpha and omega though. Um, 
I think they've gone through like every significant uh, historical figure that they could with si with similar initials, and they just haven't been able to link this to any particular patron. I'm I'm sort of intrigued by Alpha and Omega, though. Uh, great great thought there. <laughs> I like that. This refers to the last couple of works with the visions of hell. There yeah. are so many figures; it's overwhelming. It really is, was, isn't it? Was that the intent? And why are there so many miniature figures? I can't recall the scale of the overall work, the person says. Right. And these figures are really tiny, too. And this is uh, um, this is probably sort of coming out of Gothic imagery, too. If you're, if you're familiar with Gothic churches, that there was a tendency to put a Last Judgment sculpture, like a relief sculpture, right over the door, and usually a depiction of hell with tiny little naked figures, like writhing in pain, right above the door as you're walking in. So you have this sense of like, okay, I'm headed into my salvation. So there is already kind of a visual tradition connected to this but then artists like like Bosch and Van Eyck here I think they just let their imaginations run wild when it comes to this kind of depiction it's interesting to think about like crushing all these bodies together in such a tight confined space too I mean if any of us were this close to anybody maybe even pre-pandemic we'd probably be pretty uncomfortable um so there's there's that sense of claustrophobia there too, but in this case, I mean, they are accompanied by all of these kind of demonic, evil-looking monsters. So it just it's like layers and layers of of um, being uncomfortable, really <laughs> being tortured here. So that's a great question. Um, someone else adds, "There's a great video on YouTube in which in which a clothing historian replicates the famous outfits." And she had an episode on the Arnold Feeney dress. Oh, she talked about the goodness. value of heavy wool cloth, emphasizing the wealth of the couple. Um, oh my, that's so cool. I'm going to have yeah. to look up that YouTube. I, I mean, this is quite the dress, right? Especially that, that hem detail right there. And it's lined with fur. You've got these huge sleeves. I mean, you know that this is a significant outfit that she's wearing here. So I would love to, to hear something more from, a, from a, an expert on, on clothes to talk more about that. That's great. Another question slash comment. There are some linear perspectives to locate the objects in these paintings. And there are other mathematical or geometry concepts used in these paintings. Uh, um, are there, excuse me, other mathematical geometry concepts used in these paintings, such as golden ratio or Fibonacci sequence? Is geometry related with divine concepts for these artists? That is such a fascinating question. And um, generally speaking, I don't think that, uh, and I'm just sort of scrolling through these images to, just to jog my brain. Um, I think generally speaking, art historians don't, um, don't associate images like this with like the golden ratio or the Fibonacci sequ sequence or anything like that. It, there's a lot of like later Italian artists that are very interested in doing that. I think that's where um, those ideas were really rooted for, for this time period and this place. It really is all about bringing out the God, bringing out God through the, these mundane details of the material world. So it's like capturing, you know, the glisten on this basin over here. It's capturing this sort of interesting fold in, in the, in the vase on the table. Um, the, the perspective is really not the focus. It's, it's these, it's these individual objects and how they function together. But thanks for asking that question because it, it you know, it, it allows us to sort of zoom out, telescope out for a second, but then zoom back in on what these artists were so focused on. I mean, even just like getting all the nails in this door. I mean, they're just fascinated by the details. I mean, Dan Brown really should have written the Da Vinci Code about this period because everything has symbolic meaning as opposed to, you know, the Italian Renaissance where everything is really more about perspective and, and, and you know, uh, golden ratios and that sort of thing. Here, it's it's about strange choices that these artists make in order to tell this story about what is sacred. Mm. Lots of certainly thought-provoking questions. Um, I'd just like to mention the next program is going to be March 5th, again with you, Jane, 
on the Parisian cafes and impressionistic paintings. So Sunday, March 5th, um, Marnie was nice enough to put that link in the uh, chat. So for anybody who wants to sign up, feel free. Um, I'd like to open the questions up to anybody who may want to ask Jane questions that aren't from the chat. Please uh, feel free just to jump in and do so. Jane, can you go back? This is Dana again. Can you go back and re-explain um, the picture that you have up with the mouse um, concept in there? Because I did see a mouse in that um, the uh, Bosch painting too. Um, yep. There was um, a mouse in there. I think that the the mouse association here is really like mundane. It's of the everyday world because that is what. Uh, Joseph is building in his carpenter shop. I mean, we think of like the easy mouse trap that we that we know today, but this would have been a mouse trap design for that period, that early 1400s period. And the the concept here related to a particular, um, I think it was a writing by by Saint Augustine who said that that Christ functioned on the crucifix like a mouse trap that was there to capture the devil. Got so, um, so mouse traps in and of themselves had this kind of greater spiritual significance. If you included it, especially if you include it in in a painting with within this context of of you know everything has symbolic meaning. So that's that's the way that's generally understood. I mean, and and I mean, art historians have tried to sort of explain, analyze every detail of what Joseph is doing here, down to the fact that he's like boring these holes into this piece of wood here. I mean they've connected that to like um the crucifixion of, of of Jesus and like the nails going through his body so um it does it doesn't always make sense sometimes it feels like a leap or a stretch um as it does whenever anybody's trying to find symbolism in anything <laughs> but um, but for the most part I I think when it comes to the Marode altarpiece there's a lot of solid scholarship on it and I and I tend to sort of trust that that idea about the mouse traps. And is that a mousetrap on that far right panel where Joseph is sort of a giant one outside his window? I, I think the perspective's off again. I think it's supposed to be about the size of this one. Mm -hmm. um, so this would have been on his little shop shelf there so people could go up to him and buy his mousetraps. Hmm. Hi, uh, this, um, I, I love these, this, this detail on all these pictures. Uh, I just think it's fascinating. Well, I have an interest in photography and I am going to try to take pictures with detail. You know, extend, you know, if I got a picture of some people, I'm going to extend it. Maybe there's the, a lake beyond them, or maybe there's boats on the water and things, you know, I want to do, I'd like to do that. Oh, I think that's fascinating to get like a challenge from this and think about, I, I mean, that would be really challenging too with the camera lens to try and. Because I, and it's not symbolism. Off. It's yeah. not a symbol. It's just that maybe I got like that first picture with the two people sitting yeah. and then you look out and there's the city. You know, yeah. like that. That's the, something I would like to take a picture like that. You know, you got the, the subjects, and then you look all beyond that, and there's mountains, there's there's a lake, and you know, something like that. That would be amazing. Because <laughs> I already have one. I do. I don't mean to be a promoter here, but uh, <laughs> but I have at the library. I do have a display for the whole month. Oh, in, very cool. Yeah, as you go in, and as you go in on the left, there they are. Then you go around, say, to go out, they're on the, they, you see them again, another set. Well, Which thank you for that. Which library is that? Burlington. Terrific. So okay. if anybody goes to Burlington to look for those. Other questions, please, for Jane or comments? I would just like to make a comment. Jane, you had said that people in, in that period of, period of time did not have any other images. Uh, and these were, you know, their first uh, TV or movies or something. They had nothing else. And I can see the people who were seeing the depictions of hell 
they are frightening. If this is the first time, you know, after the priest or the minister or, or whoever talked about, if you don't do this, other, you're going to hell. And then you saw this. It, it's even it's even kind of frightening and unsettling to see the artist pictures of, of hell, you know, like um, so they're, they're absolutely uh, stunning. And I can I just can't imagine uh, or I try to imagine how it must be to the first time viewer who never saw anything else. So nice. Alex, <laughs> you're so good. You're so terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carol. I'll, I'll leave you with some images of hell. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it really is just so fascinating to, and I think what it really comes down to is that um, Bosch in particular had this great sense of just combining really disparate things to, um, to, to like transform them into something that was sort of horrifying. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. You can spend <laughs> like a whole day just looking at how he imagines hell. <laughs> To me, that has a dolly feel to it, doesn't it? Oh, 100%. 100%. You're actually uh, dead on the money, actually, Dana, because right over here in the creation panel, there's like this little face that's made. I don't know if you can see sort of like a profile face here. Dali spent a lot of time looking at this work of art, and he actually adopted this little symbol as like his own profile in a lot of his paintings, including the melting clocks painting, the persistent yeah. memory. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Jane, yeah. Yeah. I I I got uh, another thing that I'm interested in is um, the Bruegel, Peter Bruegel, yes. the Flemish painter. I like him too. Oh, he, he puts a lot of detail because it's one, you know, I like the one where uh, the fall uh, Icarus, I-C-A-R-U, is that nice to pronounce it right? Yes, yep. I love that because it's got, you know, it looks like generally, uh, you know, a car and a farmer and then, then beside, then you look out and there he comes down, you know. Yes, the, like that. there's that telescopic view. Um, yeah. Actually, I have a, a featured program on Bruegel towards the end of the year. So I'll be delving into all of this stuff again. Yeah, um, I, but, but that's really more like a century later. And, and they're kind of taking lessons from the artists that we looked at today. I'm he also kind seeing, of took stuff yeah. from this because he yeah. had it symbolic too, you know, that uh, there's one there where the there's the blind leading the blind. He had one mm -hmm. that was symbolic of the times because uh, Bruegel, Bruegel was it sometimes, it was tough times. The Spanish, Spain ruled the Netherlands at that area in that time. And I think he kind of had in his paintings a lot of what was going on. You know, that's what. Ooh, so there's like a political layer there too. I like that. Yeah, he did. <laughs> Thank you for the comment. And there's one that, that yeah. there was bad, the one that was well, the, the real tough one was it was slaughter of innocence. The one and that meant I don't know whether he was referring to Christ, the I, I, birth of Christ, or was he referring to the times that were going on in in at, in the Netherlands or or Flanders at the time. There might be double meaning there. We'll, um, we'll definitely delve into it Lou and I, um, when I present on that topic later this year. Um, Look, I, I am so fascinated with, with, with Van Eyck. I, I don't know, I just, I went to see, I saw that triptych, uh, the one, I, what was the one you showed first? It was in, I went, we went to, uh, uh, not Bruges, but Ghent. We did see that. Right. I, I yep. saw that in person. Oh, that's on my bucket list. With my wife, yeah. We had, we had a great time. And that's the one I wanted to see. And I, uh, it had fascinated me to see that because I just loved it. And of, the, of, of that time, you know, all the symbols and all of the, you know, you look and that means something and, you know, you can find so much in those. 
Well, thank you for that commentary. We really appreciate it. Jane, I'm mindful of the time and I'd like to say thank you. We look forward to seeing everybody again on the 5th next month with the Parisian cafes. Uh, quick, probably- Quick comment, quick comment be... on Parisian cafes, Dana. Sure. It's like the naughtiest of all impressionist painting. And that's why oh. I focused on it. So it, we're gonna <laughs> see some bad behavior next, next month too. Okay, more than <laughs> usual, which is good. <laughs> Well, thank you. Please feel free to take the link from the uh, chat and sign up, or you can sign up on the Rockport Library website or any of the other uh, libraries that you're affiliated with who are also sponsored. Thank you, Jane. As always, a tremendous program. I wish everybody a wonderful Sunday and see you all very soon. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Dana. Thanks, Marnie. Bye -bye. Thank you, Marnie. Thank you.